And thank you for inviting me here <coughs> to talk today. And uh, I'm really honored to be the first speaker this morning. And I'm so happy, Colin, that you asked me to talk about myself instead of about what we were talking about yesterday, because it was so impressive, it's almost impossible to take up that standard. And you are, those of you who know Colin will also know that he is an introvert person. And uh, we heard that yesterday, what that means. And I can tell you that I'm more introvert than Colin is. So this is really a challenge. Uh, <clears throat> he asked me to follow up what we heard yesterday, get personal about what you are doing in your life. And uh, I'm asked to talk about what is in it for me in this, uh, you could say, challenge about the acoustics. And uh, the story I want to tell you began, I think, four or five years ago, when I was on a vacation <clears throat> together with my family and a couple of friends in Bali. And uh, suddenly my boss, the woman with Peter, <coughs> told me uh, this story about uh, an elderly couple where the man went to the doctor and uh, uh, the husband went to the doctor and asked the doctor, what should I do? I think my wife had a hearing disability and she won't really listen to me. And then the doctor told him, oh, that's easy. When she is doing something, cooking in the kitchen, which people in my age, that's the way we do it, uh, <coughs> you just go 10, 12 meters behind her, and you ask her <coughs> quite uh, low, uh, what are we going to have to dinner today? And if she answers you, you don't have a problem. If not, you just go five, six meters near, same question. And if he answers you, you have a little problem. And if not, you go <coughs> behind her, and then you know you have a problem. She has a problem. Okay, the guy went 12 meters behind, asked what we're going to have to dinner today. Heard nothing. And then he went five meters behind, nothing. Then he was just two meters behind and asked her third time, what are you going to have to dinner today? Spaghetti for the third time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when we were on this vacation, my nickname was Spaghetti. I don't know if you've been on Bali, they are quite noisy people, and uh, I had this, you could say, problem. Uh, but the problem is that if you don't know it by yourself, you won't really recognize it. I mean, a lot of you have tried when you begin to see a little... You could say you had difficulties with reading, but I guess you all waited a little longer than you should before you bought the first pair of glasses. So we think that, no, nothing is wrong with me. So I thought the same. And uh, I mean, a couple of years earlier, I have done a quite huge project in the municipality of Genshofte, where we have uh, refurbished 11 schools, built a new one, and uh, we have even changed the system from uh, the old fashion of having a classroom and a teacher to an open learning landscape, as good as we could, but especially on the new school. And we have had a lot of discussions about uh, acoustics, and the teachers even complained. So we called for the authority in Denmark, and they measured it, and nothing was wrong. So uh, I thought, this is okay. <clears throat> but then my boss and company began to talk to me when we were at seminars like this, began to uh, ask me, why are you going so close to people when you're talking to them? You cannot go over there, what do you call that, the personal environment there, that you are interfering with their personal uh, border. You cannot do that. You need to be a little away. And I was thinking, yeah, but, but, but then I can't hear what they're saying. So I went to my doctor and I asked him, same age as me, a little older, and I asked him, said, when I'm hearing the news in the telly, it's, it's a little difficult. And he said, yeah, 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 they're mumbling. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years later, he went on pension. So um, at last, 
I went to have this surgery to have be uh, uh, what do you call that? Help me. Yeah, with my uh, hearing. And, uh, oh, you couldn't hear what she was saying. She said, I was examined on my hearing. And uh, I got the <coughs> totally to know how bad it is. This is, uh, as you probably know, uh, the uh, uh, speaking banana and an undamaged hearing. And uh, if we then look at a normal uh, damaged hearing, it looks like this. You lose the uh, difficult part of the consonants, but you are still able to manage without having any hearing aids and you can act quite normal. And then when you get to my age, <coughs> you probably will be about here. And the meaning that, yes, it's almost like having a, a, a damage, but it's little worse because the, the curve is just going down the whole way and, and, and you should, all you around me here that are on this edge, you should try to go and have the control because you are all in acoustics. Okay, my hearing is down there. So it's obvious that I was in uh, problems. <coughs> So I got my hearing aid and uh, yeah, it was, it was really like being reborn in a part of my head. And uh, it also showed up that uh, I improved my English. I'm sure it's not good enough yet, but before I got my hearing aid, it was so difficult for me to hear other people's English that I couldn't uh, take it in and use it for my own language. So I was not able to make a speech like this. Haven't been because this damage I've had since I was about 20. And uh, the English language in uh, Europe was growing, I guess, about 20 years ago or something. So it's 20 years later that we all began to need to speak English. And uh, I had this damage, so uh, I had really troubling. And uh, my daughter Mia was often telling me, no, 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 this is not the right word. This is the right word. And I had so difficulties to understand that. I hope you understand my English now, because I feel myself that it's much better. OK, in the meantime, while this was going on in my family, uh, I, thank you, I was uh, <coughs> meeting up with Echophone, with Maybrit and uh, Colin. <clears throat> and we were talking about the challenge <clears throat> to open up the schools and all these acoustics, you could say, problems or challenges that it means. And I know a lot of you, because I talked with a good group of you about these open plan schools or these landscapes, learning landscapes, and almost all of you are telling me this is impossible because the task you have to solve is really difficult. So I told my brother and colleague, no, 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 no. This is so easy. You just do what we did in this municipality in Genshofter, where we did these, all these schools, opened them up, and invited my brother out to listen to uh, the, uh, one of the schools in Genshofter, where we were especially proud, the Maulgård School. And uh, it was quite, you could say, it was quite a shock because uh, uh, it was really a wake-up call for me because we just went into the school and I had my new hearing aid, not new, but a year old or something at that time, and uh, was showing my, can you hear? This is, no, no, this is not, this is really not working. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> as you can see what we did at the time, <clears throat> was that we did what everybody did at, the, at that time, and still a lot of architects still do. We used these uh, Trolltech uh, acoustic regulation directly up in the ceiling and uh, thought this was okay. And this was also a school that the, the authorities in, uh, in Copenhagen had been measuring, and they thought it was okay. But I can tell you it is really not okay, and of course uh, you know that. Uh, a lot of people will think, but, but why didn't you really uh, 
try to get it to work when you knew that you did these new kind of schools. And we did. We really talked about it. We really uh, knew that when we were inspired by Don and Don and Howard Gardner with all these openness, we had to solve this problem. And the funny thing is that I was one of the people, the architects in the group, who really talked about how important this is. And uh, of course, I also controlled this area, went out there and listening, and it was quite okay, there was no noise. Uh, <clears throat> but after we uh, met up with Echophone and especially uh, Mybrid, we now have been around on more of the schools in Genshofte, and we are now trying to talk them into change the schools where I was the boss for this project and haven't been working with the, the municipality for the last 10 or 11 years. And uh, the mayor is the same, but the rest of the people there are almost uh, new people. But we are trying to tell them that what we did at the time is not that good, so we need to do something. And on uh, one of the schools where for kids with special needs, we uh, <coughs> have already done one experiment uh, to try to show them how it uh, could be. And uh, on this school, Malogor School, we uh, think, hope, depending on your founding, <laughs> that we will do an uh, experiment also there to show them that, yes, you can still use your uh, learning uh, environments, but we need to help you out with the acoustics you have been right for and I think a lot of you have tried this, you have been right for the last 10 years when you have complained about this project. <clears throat> uh, I just want to show you <clears throat> another example that was uh, really meaningful for me because I went down to a school in Barcelona where they, a year before, I think, I showed them Hello School and they adapt the idea about learning landscape and <clears throat> we were invited down there to see what they have done together with a seminar we participated in and they just refurbished this school for a couple of millions and they built a new part to the school also for a couple of millions and they were so proud and they showed me this school and asked me isn't this a nice school? Don't you think this old, old school we now have refurbished into something that really are going into the future? And uh, I got this hearing aid I said, talk to you about it, so I had to tell them, no, this is not going to work. And they said, but, but what are we going to do? And uh, we just now, for a couple of months ago, together with DP Acoustia from Barcelona and together with Ecophone from Madrid, we have uh, taken down in a couple of areas, uh, in a, around, I guess, 240 square meters in the canteen and in an education area, we have taken down all the new uh, ceilings. They are only one and a half year old and we put in for a little more than, I guess a little more than a half a million because, of course, these uh, uh, ceilings uh, that uh, were put up in, in uh, Gibbs, is that carbon? Gibson. Gibson? Gibson. Okay. <laughs> uh, they just finished that, and uh, uh, they are quite tough to take down. So, uh, we, but we did that, the, the, the leadership of the school, after we explained to them what this means, they said, yeah, we don't want you to try to help this out. We want you to tell us what should it have been, and then let's try to do that in a couple of areas and see how it works out. So uh, we did this, and uh, yeah, with really, really a great result. And we had the same experience as I had with, with uh, Mybrid on uh, Malgo School, because <clears throat> this is a Catholic school and run by nuns. It's one of the best schools in uh, uh, Spain. And uh, I'm not sure they understood what we were talking about when we were talking about it, but they trusted us. And they could see that this 
uh, open learning and environment wasn't really working. And uh, yeah, looking at you and say yes, of course it wasn't working uh, because the acoustics was awful. But they believed in the idea. They believed in that we need to change from teaching to learning. We need to go to learning landscape. We need to go to a situation in our education where the students, they, like small scientists, walk out in life and try to find out what is this about and find their own way through uh, uh, their education and learning by and just being coached by uh, the, the uh, teachers. So because they trusted in that, they asked us to do what we thought we needed to do. And uh, they really also got a wake-up call. When this was finished, uh, they just said, wow, what is this? Why have we had this kind of school all the rest of the years? And, and those of you who know about Spain knows that, uh, yes, it's quite a noisy country. <laughs> I'll try now to give you an impression of what I think this is about. Two of my kids, they use glasses, done that from they were small. And I also think that this was my experience when I grew older and needed glasses. You just get used to that you don't see it so sharp, you even forget it. And the funny thing is that if you never, like me and my hearing aid, has seen this in another way, you can participate in a discussion about the tower, about the cross in the top, about that there are people working, uh, walking here and there must be a restaurant over here. You can participate in that discussion. So how could you know that the people you are talking to, they are hearing a totally different picture? And here it is a picture. How can you know that? If you've never seen it or never heard it differently, it's totally impossible. So it's probably also so now that among us, we all have a different hearing. And about the hearing, we even cannot show what we are talking about. We, we can only talk, we can only try to use each other's hearing and each other's way of communicate. So it's totally impossible for us to know how do the kids experience our education areas. We can only imagine. So uh, this is one of the situations that I try to explain what I think happened to me. The other thing I'll try to explain is that when we did Herald School, we knew that this is so different. So we will have the the, the parents, uh, the politicians, and everybody, we will, the, the press, and I can tell you we really got the press, uh, we will have them to just fall over this project and ask us, what are you doing? Because we did a school in three storage with no classroom, no doors, nothing, only doors to the toilet, and it showed up to the principal because he wanted his own office, but the rest of the school is totally open, there are really no doors. Three stories in one open, uh, you could say, figure. And so we knew, I could talk hours about why we did that, but here the interesting story is we knew that people would talk about what are you doing. So <clears throat> we asked <clears throat> one of the engineer companies in Copenhagen to take care of the acoustics. Here we didn't thought that we knew beforehand that we could just do what we normally do. So we asked them, <coughs> and they made a, a <coughs> three or four, I'm not sure, but I think it was three different, you could say, sound uh, environments, artificial, of course, <coughs> and they asked us to listen and find out which of these sound environments do you think you need in this kind of learning environment. And uh, especially me, being the CEO of the project, and uh, the principal, a little older than me, uh, with no hearing aid, and probably with a hearing damage, of course, we listened and we made a choice. And today I'm totally sure that this is a choice we made. So if we compare with, you know, these... Uh, <coughs> uh, 
elements where you are asked to look at them and see if you can see a number in here. And if you can see a number in here, if you can see number nine, you have a problem. If you can see number six, you probably doesn't have a problem with this. But just trying to explain to you what we did was that we couldn't see, we couldn't hear. So we took this and said, now we know that this school has a totally right uh, uh, acoustic regulation. And by luck, because this must be by luck, it showed up that it could also be we just choose the one in the middle. Uh, but by luck, it almost worked. We had some complaints, but most of the complaints was, of course, because this new uh, uh, approach to learning with kids running around everywhere and with no classrooms. Of course, there is more noisy than there would be in a normal school, but it wasn't uh, uh, more noisy than everybody was thinking, yeah, this could be an idea, and they regulated a little more on it, and then uh, it was uh, quite okay. Uh, it's because I'm not totally sure what the next picture is, but uh, I think I know. Uh, <coughs> Just to end up the story about uh, these two pictures trying to compare with when, when it's your eyes, there's something wrong with where it's in fact a little easier to level in and know a little about what can the other parts see, because we have all these measuring instruments and then we can combine the colors in another way and then we can show you how your eyes could be if they were right and you can feel that there is something wrong and so on. This is so much more difficult when you're talking about uh, the hearing. And uh, yesterday, one of you told me that it must be almost impossible to take care of acoustics if you have a hearing aid. But I can assure you that if you need a hearing aid, which I'm sorry to say that, I'm totally sure a lot of us do because we have the aids. Uh, so if you need it and you don't have it, it's really so much more difficult. It's, it's so much more easier after you got this, because then you suddenly... I mean, I don't know if I hear the same uh, sound as you do, but I know that I can hear something when you can hear it. And, uh, I mean, I, I also know that uh, I... Uh, once, when we went to uh, uh, Africa, were out in nowhere, and uh, I was asking my wife, what is this noise? We are in nowhere. And uh, it's uh, sounding like uh, there's a factory around here. And she said uh, that, uh, but haven't you ever heard this before? We have been in nowhere before this. We've been in Australia and listening to this and you told me you could hear it. I said, yeah, but I haven't heard this before. It's the cicadas you're hearing. And uh, I realized that when I told her, yes, I can hear them, it, which I did in Australia, it was only a really, really weak, weak noise in my ears, just from the nature. So I never heard them, but I thought I heard them. So this is really, I think, the uh, difficult part about when we need to have some help to our hearing. And uh, I also think, for me, <coughs> personally, it's <coughs> really a wake-up call around what it means for the kids when we are not supporting their <coughs> education areas in a way where they can hear the small consonances, they can hear all the high frequencies, so they are able to get the new languages, able to get all the details. And... Uh, oh, I had to do like this. And now, <clears throat> I'm trying to uh, do these new learning landscapes with, yeah, I must say, in fact, with a focus on acoustics. Because 
I'm aware of now that if we want these learning landscapes to be the new way of having a school, which we really believe in, which we travel around the world to talk about, uh, if the acoustics isn't okay, then nobody believes in it. It's difficult enough if the acoustics is okay, because of course there will be more noise. So what we try now is that we really try to have a an, 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 uh, uh, diverse uh, area with a lot of different possibilities for learning, education, teaching, whatever. We do a lot of uh, diversity to be sure that we don't need to have flexibility, but we can move to another area and in that way. And then, of course, we uh, do a special effort to do the acoustics a lot more better than uh, the law or the rules around the world are uh, telling us uh, to do. Uh, yeah, that was my personal uh, experience about suddenly be able to hear after... I forgot to tell you, my hearing uh, damage is from the military. Uh, I was a machine gunner. Uh, I never went to war, but I really practiced. And uh, a real man at that time would never do anything to protect his ear. Man, they just shoot. And I did. Thank you.